Okay. Hello everyone and welcome to the World Parks Academy webinar series. My name is Hannah and I'm your host today from the Epley Institute for Parks and Public Lands at Indiana University. This webinar is brought to you by World Parks Academy in association with World Urban Parks. Um, before we get started here, before I introduce our presenter today, um, I'll give you a brief tour of Adobe Connect. If you can hear me all right, looks like we have two people joining us from South Africa. If you can hear me okay, just uh, raise your hand by clicking the drop-down uh, feedback icon at the top of the screen. Nice. Let me check to make sure that they can hear us. Sure. Manuel, raise your hand. Yep. All right. So, well, hopefully, if they have any problems, they'll send us a message in the chat box. All right. If we could go ahead and also update our information here in the attendee list by clicking the drop down, edit right. my info. Type in Epley Institute. Help us see where everyone is from. Okay. And if you have any questions, just use the chat box at the bottom of the screen. Also, if you're experiencing any audio feedback, go ahead and mute your microphone um, while, while the presenter is speaking. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our presenter today. We have Jason Summers, um, Manager of Parks and Open Spaces from Dallas, Victoria, Australia. And he will be presenting on different strategies uh, for creating large canopy trees in urban areas. So it's all you, Jason. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Hannah. And uh, thanks for the people who have joined. I'll just wait for the presentation to light up. Um, Taking a bit of time. Okay. All right. Um, thanks for the opportunity to, uh, from World Urban Parks and from the World Parks Academy to uh, present today. Um, I just want to uh, give you a bit of background about myself, um, just so you know uh, where I'm coming from. Um, I have an interest in horticulture. I did a Bachelor of Applied Science degree at the University of Melbourne. Um, uh, an undergraduate degree in horticulture, and I also have completed a master's degree of forest science by research at the University of Melbourne. Um, I'm also on the board of the World Urban Parks Academy uh, for representing Australasia, and I'm also on the state board for Victoria and Tasmania for the Parks and Leisure Australia. Yeah, I'm involved in um, as a convener of uh, professional development helping organise seminars and conferences. Uh, also on the TreeNet Advisory Board, which is TreeNet's a symposium held annually in Adelaide in South Australia, um, looking at trees in urban areas. Uh, and also on a committee for Greening the West, which is a program uh, of greening in Melbourne's western suburbs. Um, and when I get to my spare time, I also have a course advisory committee member um, for the associate degree in urban horticulture at the University of Melbourne, and I'm employed for, uh, for work at, as a park manager at Hume City Council. You know, enough about me, but I just sort of give you some background. Uh, I always had an interest in trees, um, 
and yeah, that's where I've sort of come from and that's my background. Uh, the things I want to cover in the presentation today is, I don't think it's disputed, but the need for large canopy trees and, and that size does matter and make a difference to how trees perform in an urban environment. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about some of the challenges uh, in highly urbanised areas to achieve large canopy trees. And look at a few options that are available that I've observed. Uh, look at some case studies in Toronto, who are probably one of the world leaders in this space. Uh, some examples from Chicago, uh, Washington DC and New York. Um, and also some uh, studies on some sites uh, at my local council where I work in Melbourne uh, at Tender and Way. Um, I'll show you some examples of what we've done there. And also another example in Sydney, in New South Wales, of um, some projects that have occurred using uh, water sensitive urban design. I'll talk a little bit about uh, using trees in water sensitive urban design and why we should be doing that more. Uh, and then one of my, to finish up, I want to talk a bit about um, passive irrigation of landscapes. Uh, and I'll explain a bit more as we go along. So hopefully uh, you'll find it informative and I'm happy at the end to take questions um, and hopefully uh, we'll get through it. Thank you. All right, next slide. All right, uh, I think what do large trees mean? Well, large trees obviously have more shade, um, which can, can convert to more energy savings. Um, cleaner air, because they can clean more air because they're larger. Um, Better stormwater management, uh, and this is related to the fact that um, the, the increased canopy has increased uh, surface area and can intercept more water um, and take pressure off uh, local drainage systems. Um, and you can get more shaded streets, um, which uh, there's some research that suggests that if you shade a street with a tree, it actually prolongs the life of the, uh, the, the bitumen or the surface on the road because uh, it's not exposed to UV light. Um, but also larger trees offer exponentially more benefits than smaller trees. Um, if I had a choice in a street or a park um, and I had space, I'd put in 10 larger trees rather than 20 or 30 smaller trees. Um, obviously they've got to put trees where they'll fit and in the right spot. But there's, so, so really size does matter in relation to trees and their cooling benefits. All right, now I'll talk a bit about the challenge of getting large canopy trees in urban areas. Um, space is probably the biggest issue. Usually um, that's above ground um, with power lines and utilities, buildings, signs, um, trucks, vehicles on the road, uh, but also below ground. Um, a lot of trees in urban areas have uh, scarce soil resources. To, to grow within and have to compete with hard services um, and also with um, services and things that are underground, drainage and other, other infrastructure. Um, adding water um, into the equation with trees in, in urban areas can offer some solutions and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and also getting optimum tree growth in urban soils, which are often made up of uh, fill, rocks and concrete, can be often challenging. Uh, I mentioned the overhead obstacles in infrastructure, uh, the perceived conflict with infrastructure. This is more about, in my opinion, poor design and not giving the trees appropriate space to grow within, and we'll cover some of that. And also the perceived cost to achieve good results. People think by concentrating on the soil and creating root volume, the additional cost is not worth the benefit. But I hopefully I'll dispel some of those myths and get people thinking that if we do the right thing under the ground, we can leave trees in uh, and change over the skin of, of, a, of a landscape, the, the hard surfaces, a number of times. And hopefully leave the trees in situ uh, and actually get some savings uh, when we redevelop an area. Um, that's that sort of the last point there about trees can be retained through upgrades if the system is designed well. So what I'm going to, I'll keep moving along. So what I'm going to talk about is some of the systems that can be used. Um, firstly, I took this photo at the uh, National Arboretum 
in Washington DC uh, of a, I think it was a 400 year old bonsai tree. And uh, it's quite an impressive tree, but this picture sort of represents to me what we do with urban trees. Uh, we plant them usually in a cut out hole. Um, we don't really make a lot of provision for soil. And then we wonder why trees don't perform or don't grow to their full potential. Um, you see a lot of the artist's impressions of a landscape or a streetscape. And often the, um, uh, often the, um, what can happen is, uh, oh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Yeah, oh, you know, these artist's impressions, often they show, you know, massive trees. Um, but the reality is that those trees will never grow to that uh, to that to that size uh, in relation to um, you know what the pictures depict in the artist's impressions. All right, um, this is a, a chart I got off uh, James Urban. James Urban's a landscape architect in North America, um, which looks at what they recommend should be the root volume. Um, associated with a tree based on the crown thread that you want to achieve. Um, so if you want to get a tree that's um, got a uh, diameter, a breast height of say um, uh, a crown thread of six, 640 centimetres, basically you need a, a volume of around 28 cubic metres to get a to get a uh, 16 inch diameter tree. So and you can obviously use this graph to look at other other sizes, depending on what size you want a tree to grow. Now this is uh, based on some research that's been done. Uh, and Toronto in Canada, um, for an individual tree in a, in a roadside streetscape, they, they request or, or sort of demand around 30 cubic metres per tree. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about that as well. So this gives you an idea of some of the volumes you need. And 30 cubic metres is quite a volume. Uh, in a sidewalk of a street when you've got roads nearby and buildings. Um, I'd just like to credit James Urban for allowing me to use these images. I met up with James when I was in my, on a study tour of the US and told him that I wanted to talk about this stuff in Australia and he said he's welcome me to use his images. So what this picture is showing is what we normally do with streets, uh, trees in streets in urban areas. Um, we've got um, basically lots of hard surfaces, poor drainage, um, paving right up to the tree, very little soil to exploit, um, infrastructure like drainage and stuff that can provide some water but obviously can cause damage to the drainage. Um, we get a smaller tree, they live, they live less for a less, less of a life and basically uh, don't do that well. So this is what we tend to how we tend to treat trees, and that's why a lot of the times trees in urban areas, especially in streetscapes and malls and hard stand areas, don't perform. We don't really think of much about the actual uh, underground uh, provision for the trees. So this next slide shows what a tree can look like with good resources, and this is what I'd call a tree in a park. Um, basically it's got plenty of space for the roots to flare and the trunk to grow and to heave up the soil. It's got adequate respiration between the, the ground and the, and the roots. Um, it's got infiltration because there's no runoff, because there's no hard surfaces. And we get a good canopy. Um, we get good retention of water in the canopy. We get a lot of roots growing in the, in the top horizon of soils. And um, we actually get a good result. And this is what we want to try and mimic, if we can, in an urban area. Um, this can be challenging, but there are some ways we can do that. Excuse me. Right. Uh, here's one solution, um, option, I suppose. Um, structural cells, um, a company called Deep Root. There are other brands around that can do this, but they can actually sort of mimic that park like environment by supporting the above um, hard surfaces, um, like pavements or asphalt, or whatever it might be, but allowing the tree to grow in an uncompacted soil environment. So um, if you can see that, that these systems can actually um, support the pavements, but also allow for, and depending how they're installed, um, air, 
oxygen to get into the soil and need um, moisture and also um, the, the uh, evapotranspiration of the canopy. So we can actually get a good long growing tree in these sort of systems. So this is what we're trying to achieve in an urban area if you want to get large canopy trees. And this is one of many systems, as I mentioned earlier, that you can use to do that. Um, here's some examples of um, different methods uh, that you can actually achieve. And, and the, the example at the top left is a car park um, where we can use a structural soil. And a structural soil, and if people aren't aware what structural soil is, it's basically um, quite large diameter rocks, uh, like a railway ballast with a bit of soil in amongst them that can be compacted to actually hold pavements, but also allow tree growth through them. So this brown area marked off in here um, is actually uh, can uh, actually support the pavement, but also support tree growth. And, and you can see here that in this design, uh, with the tree opening, they can actually get about 36 cubic metres per for this tree, which will mean we get a good, healthy growing tree. Um, the other, the other example is uh, a street side curb. I know people call them different things, but basically a, a, a footpath um, in an urban area. You've got your road over here, um, and you've got your structural uh, cells supporting the pavement, but also allowing for a good um, volume. And this is getting about um, 33 cubic metres for this tree at a, about a 9.6 metre spacing. So here's some ways you can go about achieving optimum tree growing conditions, but also um, uh, creating the space, but also supporting the pavement and the infrastructure around it. But, all right, um, I'm going to go into a bit more detail on some uh, North American work that I observed back uh, three years ago, late 2013. I was lucky enough to get a Parks and Leisure Australia um, Greg Maddock Memorial Scholarship. And that allowed me to attend the Toronto ISA conference. Um, and um, is where I learned, actually met James Urban and, and learned a lot about more about this sort of stuff and have used some of those learnings back in Australia, which I'll talk about later. As I mentioned earlier, um, Toronto City hosted the conference. Um, and as I said earlier, they are sort of a world leader. They they dictate or allow about 30 cubic metres per tree if you're putting one tree in an area like this. Um, the, and I'll talk a bit, a bit, a bit later about they actually allow, have a smaller allowance per cubic metre if you're putting trees in a continuous trench where the, the, the trees can interact and grow roots between them. So um, at the ISA conference, I've got to have a look at some of the city projects, and I'll talk a bit about those. Also going to talk a bit about, uh, I went across to Chicago and had a look at uh, Millennium Park um, in, in Chicago, which is pretty much a whole park on top of a car park, so it's like a roof garden. Um, and I'm going to talk a bit about some of the um, department, district department of transport projects in Washington, D.C., um, and also some projects I observed in New York and some research. I'll keep moving along. Um, here's an example of uh, a site on Lake Ontario where they've used the system to prop up the pavement uh, and then they've used uh, structural soil underneath them. Um, and this is sort of the end result. So this whole area here is pretty much a growing medium underneath the pavement. Um, those, those pavers there actually have gaps between them to allow water through. There's also drainage in place to ensure that the trees don't drown. And as you can see from the images, the trees are quite healthy. I think this was done three years earlier uh, but, um, when I visited back in 2013. But, yeah, it's a quite, a, quite a nice walk area with well-growing trees and good shade on a nice summer's day in, in Toronto. Uh, here's another project that the Toronto uh, City had done. Uh, and this is a vault system. So above the, above the pavement, it looks like just about any other pavement. But the whole um, footpath and pavement area is suspended on a slab and underneath the trees have a growing media, um, which is uncompacted um, to actually grow uh, within. And they trialled, um, I think, five different species along this streetscape. And they all seem to be doing quite well. Uh, obviously, they've got protection for the uh, trees. 
one thing I noticed a lot in North America was people tying their bikes to trees. So these, which damages them, uh, but uh, but they put these guards around them until the trees get big enough to be able to cope themselves. Um, so that was an interesting project. Um, in the main, one of the main roads through Toronto in the city centre, um, they used a crate system where, um, because the trees were in a continuous joined system, they only had to provide 20 cubic metres per tree instead of the individual allowance of 30 cubic metres per tree. Um, and what they found is they did a combination of these raised garden beds with the floral displays, um, and the trees in those have done quite well versus these uh, sort of sunken um, tree pits where unfortunately a lot of the um, salt from the ice um, de-icing programs ended up washing into and, and causing uh, problems with the growth of some of the trees. So you can see in this next picture this is what the system looks like. Um, so this, hasn't got, uh, this doesn't have structural soil, this just has um, um, nice sandy loam soils. Uh, but they're also, the whole pavement is supported by this crate system. And as you can see from this picture here, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but um, hopefully you can. Um, where the trees were in these lower pits, um, salt spray from the de-icing works was affecting the trees' growth. Uh, the ones in the raised garden beds did well. Uh, have done better. Um, moving on from Toronto, I then went down to Chicago to Millennium Park. Um, and this park is basically built on top of a, a car park uh, in the middle of downtown Chicago between uh, Lake, Lake Michigan and the CBD. Um, the park was called Millennium Park. It was meant to open the year 2000. I think it opened a couple of years later. But um, it's got an expected shelf life of about 40 years. So after 40 years, of these trees and the whole park being on top of the car park, um, it'll basically be all ripped up and started again. They'll pull it all up, take the soil out, all the concrete, all the, all the artwork and stuff, um, reline the car park roof, um, which is underneath, stop leaking, and redo the park, which is a huge cost, um, but it's um, a way they can have this car parking with the park on top of it. Quite expensive, you can imagine. Uh, and as an example, uh, at an adjacent park, and this is some more shots of the park, um, with lots of artworks and, and very quite well-established trees. Uh, so this is 2013, so this is uh, about 12 years, 11 years after it was planted, and the trees were doing really well, and the park was doing very well. Um, the earlier park uh, adjacent to Millennium Park, this photo here, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but this is the Millennium Park on the corner here, and this is the Maggie Daly Park, which is an older park planted probably uh, 30 to 40 years earlier. Um, and at the time I was there, um, the whole park had been removed, um, and they were redoing the lining of the park. So um, this is a bridge that joins the two parks together. And this is some photos of Maggie Daly Park, which I think it's been replanted since I've been there, um, but. Uh, this is what it looked like when I was there. So that that area there was a park, um, and you can see um, the the plastic lining, the membrane that they put down to stop the leaking. Apparently, the people in Chicago were quite um, what's the word for it? Used to having their cars getting wet from water dripping through the car park roof. So it got to a point where it was quite bad. So they had to uh, start again, and that's, I think that was about 40 years after the park was done. So. Um, gives you an idea. So yeah, um, I've got these photos of some more recent works done. I think these are a couple of years old now. I should have probably gone and got some more recent ones, but you can see the park being redeveloped on top of the car park. Um, and I think it's, the park is definitely open now and finished, um, adjacent to Millennium Park. But the soil volumes here are massive, and um, basically they're just using um, the car park roof as a massive roof garden of acres. So yeah, it's quite impressive. And if you haven't been to Chicago, it's well, well worth a visit. Um, here's another example of some different ways that, uh, that the city in Chicago accommodates trees. Um, these trees are all in sunken uh, joined trench pits. Um, obviously, a bit of water can come through these grates. 
um, but the soil underneath is, is uh, allows the trees to grow quite good. So it's quite a nice plaza, quite a shady area in the city. Um, saw a lot of um, green walls and green facades. These are basically just climbers growing on a car park to sort of soften the car park. And green facades are uh, a lot easier to grow than a green wall um, because they're, they've obviously got a bit more root volume in these pots. Sometimes they're growing from the ground up, um, but it gives you an idea of some of the things you can do to try and soften a city. All right, uh, moving along, um, after Chicago, um, I was lucky enough to uh, catch up with some people from Washington, D.C. And um, to me, this is sort of an ultimate um, planting of a wide boulevard in, in Washington DC, not far from the White House, which has almost 100% canopy cover. Um, I don't know, um, I wasn't able to speak to the city guys about what treatment occurred under here, but given the size of the trees, I'd say there must be some um, area for these trees to grow and they haven't still done a lot of damage to the pavement. Um, but it was quite impressive. Um, it was a bit wet this day, but uh, it showed you the sort of um, size of the trees and the canopy in them. One thing I can say about the streets in Washington is they're quite well um, wide and, and, and allow for big double boulevards like this, uh, which was quite interesting. Um, here's an interesting area, a newly developed area in Washington DC in an old army, uh, navy base I think it was. But you can see these two trees here in the different lines. Same species, uh, these are Zelkovas, planted at the same time. These obviously have a quite a large garden bed area. Doesn't look like a lot of provision was made for roots and, and, and growing media under this tree. And you can see the, the result. Trees almost two to three times larger. So that's the haves and the have nots. So um, yeah, it's quite interesting. Um, all right, moving along. So. Yeah, there's a couple of ways you can either provide open garden beds like this, which allow infiltration and soil and, and uh, gaseous exchange and, and good root growing environments, or you, you can try and put them in like this, and then you can see the different corresponding growth and the difference in, in the result. Some of the other stuff um, the district department of transport were doing was actually uh, rain gardens. Um, so this this is a, um, a car park and a new um, facility has been built and they're taking the runoff from the street, um, treating it in a rain garden, but they're also putting trees into these areas. Um, and also they've got these little fences around them to stop people falling in, I think, but also dogs and things getting into them. Um, but the rain gardens were quite popular in Washington, D.C. Um, yeah. the, um, here's another example of some different types of rain gardens. Again, they've got curb inlets where the drainage of the street is passively drained into these areas um, and they've got trees and an understory to provide some amenity and some relief from the concrete. This is quite new. This I think this is only about two years old. Um, this was in, I think it's called the Navy Yards in Washington DC. The Department of Transport Office was just around the corner. And there's a great brewery down here which we had a few beers at as well. Alrighty, moving along. Um, when I was at Washington, I made an effort to go out and to visit a group, uh, a not-for-profit group called Casey Trees. Uh, Casey Trees was set up um, by a philanthropist after the um, sort of Dutch elm disease disaster that hit Washington DC and they lost a lot of their trees to um, Dutch elm disease. Um, and so Casey Trees is set up to try and encourage private tree planting and um, public tree planting and they do a lot of research and this this doesn't this is actually a rain garden here which takes water from the curb inlet um, these stands here have more for people to get out of their car and get across safely into the footpath but what they've done here they've actually got a sump uh, in, in in their office and this is their offices here where they drain all the roof water into this sump and these trees have root access under the under these pavements they've actually um, allowed a growing medium underneath the pavement so the tree roots can get into the sump and get, a, uh, get water from the surrounding property. So they're, they're doing some quite good research. They have massive tree planting programs and plant donation schemes as well. 
Alrighty, um, moving right along. Um, actually, it was quite interesting. I wanted to learn from them, but they also wanted to learn from myself for what we're doing in Australia. So I ended up doing a presentation to them and I heard a bit about what they were doing as well. Um, they have quite a large tree planting program in the city. Enjoy what they do. Uh, the District Department of Transport have a quite a massive, um, what they call a depaving program, um, where they actually actively look for large areas of concrete pavement or pavers and look if they can reduce the area and put in irrigated turf and trees. They spend around, I think it's five million US a year in Washington, identifying hotspots through um, infrared and um, uh, heat mapping. And then they approach, for example, this picture here, before it was a, uh, a school, um, and basically from the fence to the, to the road was concrete. And it wasn't really required. I'm not sure why it was there, but so the Department of Transport ripped all that up, put in structural soil underneath the trees, the, the footpath here, but also planted trees and put in irrigated turf. Now the school looks after the turf, the city looks after the trees, and we get a, a nice cool spot. Um, and they do that every year in different places. This is just one example I took a photo of. There was a number near other schools and private factories and stuff, um, which, yeah, they're actively removing concrete, which is not a bad thing because we've got too much in cities. All right, um, moving right along. Uh, after Washington, I, I actually went across um, from Washington to um, uh, Baltimore, and I haven't got any photos of that, but I caught up with some uh, researchers at the uh, USDA research farm in Baltimore and uh, spent some time there. Um, but I also managed to catch up with uh, Dr. Jason Grabowski at Rutgers University, who has a structural soil trial that's over 18 years old. So here he has some of his undergrad students measuring tree heights uh, in this trial in Brooklyn in New York. So um, if you have a look where these gentlemen are standing, uh, underneath this pavement from the fence line to the curb is structural soil um, on top of these pavements and these pavers here. And the, they've, tr they've tried about four or five species. Um, and, and the other trees on the other side are pay parked just in a park. So they're planted in a park and they have no restrictions, no structural soil. And they're trying to measure the difference in growth, both height, um, DBH, which is diameter of breast height, um, and between the structural soil trees and the trees in the parkland on the other side of the road. Um, in 18 years, and I haven't read the results um, since this particular photo was taken uh, in 2013, but there had been no significant difference in growth between the trees in the parkland area and the trees in the paved um, structural soil areas. And as you can see, there's a minor crack in the footpath over here, but around the trees, the pavement is in pretty good condition, given it's 18 years and the trees are growing well, as well as trees in the park. So I think that's a pretty good advertisement for structural soils uh, in urban areas. So yeah, that was quite an interesting time. Jason and I just talked about trees and soils and stuff and I took a few photos. Um, it, was, it was great to spend a morning with him in, in Brooklyn in New York, having a look at the trial. All right, here's some more photos of the trial. Um, you can see here the pavement's in pretty good condition. The trees are growing well, providing shade. Um, and they're growing just as well as the ones across the other side, which are growing in an uh, uncovered park-like area. So uh, yeah, it's quite an interesting trial. And um, it's prompted me to, to use some structural soils and some projects in Australia, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, I took the time to go out and have a look at the whole line, which is pretty much a roof garden on an old railway line. And you've probably heard of it and know of it. Um, but here's some photos of the High Line, this is in um, I think it was about a 30 degree day, it's quite a warm day in New York, so a lot of people enjoying the High Line, which was obviously an old elevated railway line, um, but they've got a lot of areas where they've put in trees, um, lots of different species of oaks and other things, um, and also a lot of um, flowers and uh, other plants to try and create a park in what is a concrete jungle, other than obviously Central Park. Um, so yeah, some great um, sort of vistas and shade being created by the trees, all elevated on a railway line above the city. Creates some great views and vistas, 
Um, but what it also has done is taken what was pretty much an industrial meatpacking area and turned it into a um, quite um, sought after area. And the amount of development that's occurred in investment that's occurred around the area uh, has, has increased dramatically and now it is the place to be in Manhattan in New York. And I, I walked the whole length. Um, I was just finishing off the last stage when I was there, so it would be open now. Um, but yeah, it's quite an amazing feat. Um, it came about by a group of people who saw something that other people didn't see, the opportunity to create more parkland in a city. Um, New York City don't actually manage the whole line. It's actually managed by the group that started it. They got permission to look, take over the asset and develop it. And um, yeah, it's quite an interesting um, arrangement. Um, it's quite interesting actually, a lot of the parks in New York on Manhattan Island are not managed by the city of New York. They're actually managed by conservancies, private trusts that are funded by the people of the city. Um, a lot of the billionaires and millionaires put in money to keep it looking good. Um, philanthropy like that doesn't happen in Australia, unfortunately. Um, but it's great to see that the people of New York value their parks. Um, obviously, I've got to spend some time at Central Park, but that's not what we're here to focus about. But here's some great shots, um, different trees, people enjoying the sun, the shade, um, and just the whole um, variety of landscapes that are offered in the, uh, in the High Line. All right, leaving America now, I'm heading towards Australia. And uh, I'm going to talk a bit about some of the work that I've been involved in, um, uh, just providing technical input and, and, and um, species knowledge in regards to. I can't say I designed this project, but I have certainly had a lot of input into it. I um, was involved in the design, um, constructed it, um, and now we manage it and maintain it. So to give you an idea, it's a, it's a Hume City Council managed project. We got some funding from um, Melbourne Water, which is a water authority uh, in the city of Melbourne, um, and some council funding. It was built in 2009-10, and it was open to the public uh, in late 2010. During that period, we were in the middle of the drought. Um, we actually had a complex that was part of um, quite, a, quite a dense planting. Um, and so we put the park into the streetscape and also prioritised pedestrian and um, um, riders rather than, than cars. And when you see that it's on the photos of it, you understand what I'm talking about. Um, we wanted to get large kind of trees in it. Um, the whole road is inverted so that all the water from rough from rain actually drains to the middle of the road uh, and actually waters the landscape and the trees passively and I'll talk a bit about that. Um, sensitive urban design is what we call it in Australia. I'm not sure what's called in other parts of the world. But WSUD is water sensitive urban design um, and it's basically a, um, used for treatment of water to take out nutrients and putting waters in the, in the creeks and the rivers and the bays. Um, so yeah, let's go have a look at it. Excuse me. All right, so here's a photo of it. Um, probably about two years old here. So you can see it's quite a different to a normal street. It's got a curb here, but the whole road is draining into the middle. And you can see in the middle we've got little um, little concrete blocks here, which basically got people doing U-turns through the middle garden. Um, but also um, you can see a, a rain, what we call a rain garden or a water. It's probably, as I said, year two. Um, in this hard stand area, we've got permeable pavers um, that actually um, like pedestrian traffic, not vehicle traffic, um, to, to walk over them uh, and also allow water to drain through to, to the area of the trees. Um, we did do some structural soil trials in my garden beds here. Um, I had pavement on the structural soils and that, that they were growing quite well as well. So we, this was a bit of a, um, a trial and we're learning about projects. Um, this whole um, centre garden in here is actually a, um, uh, a rain garden. It has a filter media. It's actually about 1.8 metres wide, maybe 2 metres wide by about 600 deep. And uh, there's various layers of filter uh, water treatment um, to allow um, any rainfall um, nutrients to be trapped and um, utilised by the vegetation and taken out of the water so that the receiving water is out the other end are cleaner. So this is um, quite an interesting project. Um, 
you can see a photo of here. So this is what it actually looks like. This is a filter media, basically washed turf sand. Um, we had to incorporate some nutrients to it initially um, until uh, to allow growth of the trees. Um, here we are. This is uh, one of my staff, Daniel, and he's actually uh, measuring the root ball height to work out how deep we're going to plant the tree to the uh, the middle of rain gap. Um, we're, we're still learning in, on the job as we're going along, um, but basically um, this uh, was new to us. Um, we were in the middle of drought, and I was a bit concerned that that we weren't going to get enough runoff from surrounding area to actually um, establish the landscape. So we actually installed a, uh, an irrigation system, it's a Madrid irrigation system, which I think I've got a photo of next. Um, but what, what happened is we, we planted the tree in here, uh, and two weeks later we got a call back. We did our first tree just to get our levels. Uh, and the, the engineer said, look, we've got the levels wrong. We need to move it down, I think, two or three inches lower. So I said, okay. So we, we dug back around the tree uh, um, that we planted in the sand. We'd obviously taken a plastic bag off at the stage. It was just a, a transporting bag. These are air pruned contained grown trees, 45 litres, the uh, Eucalyptus scaparia, which is uh, a native eucalypt. I think its common name is Wangara gummus or Wollongara gum, I think it's called, but Eucalyptus scaparia is, is the name of it. Um, and what we found is that the tree had grown roots out into the, the media um, three metres in less than two weeks, which is quite phenomenal. Um, so what we did is we um, basically carefully dug the tree up and reset the height and re it back in um, and then got the right, right curve. What we need is um, this photo, uh, the, this area on the road had pavement and made it level so water run off. We needed some detention in the top area of the garden Rain gun, so we need to lower the height of the tree, and uh, we've got it right eventually. Here's a cross section showing the stage, show the, the filter media, and you've got some gravel here, which is the basis for the pavement permeable plant to stand. And you can see how small these trees are here. And we planted them; they were 45 litre. So, um, got a little collar around them to pave up to to keep the pavement in shape, um, and we put these um, Onstrom German designed permeable pavers. So these pavers. In, a bucket of water and it just goes straight through them um, and basically allows water to go into the mirror, um, into the roots of trees, uh, and then eventually treat it and come out the other end clean like it was before. Excuse me. So, yeah, this is, um, as I said, this was new to us, so we had a lot of people having a look at it, looking at the pavers, understanding how it worked. This was really a demonstration site. You can see the background of the school here being built during this project. I think in the left photos, you'll see the school finished. Um, so yeah, this is a number of other councils having a look at the project and learning it all. Um, here's the rain garden section without the pavement. So you can see the drip lines in here. Um, which we're going to irrigate the landscape. Uh, and here we've planted in the uh, the reeds and cactus that are planted in here. There's a native place to the actual uh, rain garden. And uh, basically then we have to gravel mulch um, and inorganic mulch to top off the, the landscape, and I think I've got off by that. So this is, um, here's an adjacent park we've done. So council now actually builds the car parks with either a wooded swale like this or a bioretention swale. So all the car park runoff uh, from all our parks and it goes into these systems, um, which cleans the water um, and also uh, irrigates the landscape. So yeah, here's, this is an example of one adjacent. Um, this is what it looks like. A few about three or four years later, so you can see the trees growing up and the landscape certainly established uh, and it's looking good. <coughs> this is what it looks like about five years later. So the trees are really growing now. Um, you see the diameter of some of these trees have got quite large uh, and the landscape is, is maturing. Actually, getting very uh, rapid growth of these trees. Um, a tree this big would normally be 10 to 11 years old, uh, but in this system it's actually five years old and it's twice the height it would normally be. Um, so I don't know what I've done there. So next one is um, what do I need? right. So here's so what we also had is you can see this is a um, the pavement area. Um, this area of pavement in here is actually uh, an in situ an in situ resin permeable pavement. So it's poured on and sets, and it allows water to go through to irrigate the trees and the landscape. Um, and you can see it's uh, quite trafficable, and um, mainly put pedestrians can drive a truck on it. 
um, but it's actually uh, makes it a quarter an interesting area to, to look at. Um, this is a, the centre showing the centre rain guard. Um, you can see um, material washed onto it. About twice, twice a year, we do a high pressure clean on this panel pavement, um, block the inlets, and then scoop out all sediment from the high pressure clean. Um, and basically, the pavements, uh, this pavement doesn't ever block up if we, if we do that maintenance. So you can see the tree grow great well. We had to prune them twice a year for growing that fast. Um, uh, normally, we only prune them every second year. So it really, really makes a difference to the growth of the tree. And we did initially use the, um, the irrigation system, but once we got normal rainfall, after the drought had broken, um, the tree took off because they basically were getting all their water from the surrounding hard stand pavement area. All right, so this is what it looks like. I think I took this photo earlier this year, and you can see the shade cast. These trees are six year old. Um, as I do, they're probably more like a 12, 13, 14 year old tree um, in a normal, uh, certainly in a street scale. Maybe quite an old tree, uh, but in this system they're growing quite well. So, um, whilst the system costs more money to develop, again, getting better growth, we're getting water treatment, and we're actually getting the benefits of shade uh, and an environment that's quicker. Um, so, I think the, the, the extra cost is justified. You can see here, um, in about another 10 years, we'll probably have almost 80 to 100% canopy cover on this street and, and footpath. So, it's actually quite amazing, really, the amount of tree growth we've had. All right. Um, so that was stage one of Tender and Way. Um, we a few years later, um, back in 2015, we built stage two, which was further up the same street in front of our council offices. So um, this is a council managed project. Uh, we so I forgot to mention in the previous um, stage, um, this was de uh, designed by Outlands Landscape Architects. Um, all the, all the modelling for all the rain, you know, the areas, the amount of rain going to, to treat the water was all done by a company called Storm Consulting. And they basically, between them, Mr. Consulting, Outlines, Council, uh, and Melbourne Water, we covered this quite unique tree, uh, streetscape. Uh, and it is now a um, sort of working laboratory and model for other uh, people to use. And you see a lot more people doing this sort of stuff around uh, Melbourne in, in Victoria. Um, so we get back to stage two. So um, stage two was, was actually um, had some funding from Melbourne Water, but not as much this time. Um, council funded more of this. And we've actually had a, had a change the system. The, the lie of the land, this second stage, um, was a bit flatter, um, didn't really have the same catchment or um, fall across it that the stage one had. Um, so we are upgrading an existing road between the council offices and the shopping centre. We had a few in this project. We also had a bus interchange to facilitate a shopping in a car park adjacent to it. So um, there wasn't enough space to put central water sensitive, uh, water sensitive urban design element, like in stage one, uh, as I mentioned. Um, so we've, we've gone for some other ways to achieve root volume and tree growth. I'll go through those in a minute. So what we're trying to do here is we're getting all the water and rainfall directed off the pavements and the shelters towards the garden beds or our permeable tree trenches. And I'll show you a bit about some photos of them and, uh, and go through them. So um, what I'm trying to say, what we're focused on is these passively irrigated landscapes. We're not doing much water quality treatment here, although all these trenches have um, drainage and the water will eventually get out to the creek um, and the local receiving water is uh, cleaner than it was, but it's not the main focus of the system. Um, so we've, if what we've done here is we've used structural soils and permeable services around trees to provide large canopy trees and better shade. So we've actually only had the system in one year and the trees have almost doubled a year. Um, quite amazing the amount of growth. I'll show you photos. Um, so uh, here's, our, um, here's a pavement in front of our council office. Um, these are Chinese elms uh, on the harbour folio. Um, you can see the sort of garden bed, rain garden, and then this section through here is a continuous trench of structural soil that's basically the width between them. I actually wanted to go out to the road width, but the engineers were a bit nervous and were worried they were parking roads, so they didn't allow us. But we've got um, at least the width here. Probably not the volumes that um, are specified by Toronto, but I look at it this way that we've more than quadrupled, probably tenfold the amount of that would have got otherwise if we hadn't have done any of this treatment. So it, I think the trees are going to perform quite well. Um, so you can see here um, the actual uh, Chinese elms. Um, this material here in, uh, under the trees is a um, in situ poor resin again. 
So basically, all the runoff from here which has a natural fall, could designed it that way, to drain into these ditches and actually irrigate the trees. Uh, as I said, it has a water drainage hole. Um, as I mentioned, you could, if you were smart, you could actually design it from the building line right across to the trees and give the tree a lot more volume and get a lot larger tree and probably a lot quicker. But this is what we've got um, to do. So, um, next is here's some shots further down the street. You can see our council offices here. Um, you can see the, the pavement. Unfortunately, um, we didn't get a lot of this car park put into here. It was really hard to get over um, to actually be, um, be as, as involved in the project as it was in stage one, um, due to levels and stuff. But we've, we've managed to get in quite a good landscape uh, and area in here. Um, so back to the picture, you know, to see the bus shelters behind you, there's a whole lot of bus shelters, all the water off the roof of those and under the pavement of those they actually irrigate trees behind them. I have a different photo somewhere else. So yeah, he's, he's looking at it from another direction. So this whole area here of the brown sort of uh, pavement, which is a in situ poor resin, uh, which is permeable, uh, has structural soil under it. Uh, and this tree actually has structural under this pavement connecting to another garden bed adjacent to it. Um, and so these trees all have joined areas this where actually root systems can grow underneath the pavement and the actual um, resin that's poured there. Here's some uh, shots heading up one of the side streets we developed adjacent to it. So again, these trees in these areas have joined uh, root where they can grow underneath into the structural soil, which supports the um, pavement. And even between trees here, you know, this also has structural soil. So there's basically a whole growing medium under here. I've got a diagram in the next picture which sure shows explanation. So we've got a, basically the structural soil supporting the pavement and the height but also supporting the trees and the, um, the resin pavement on top. And so you can see uh, the trees have got a huge area um, to, to grow into exploit skin. Alrighty. Um, so yeah, this is just a cross diagram of what we've done in that previous shot to explain what's happening under the ground because it's a bit hard to see from this photo, obviously. So yeah, this is um, obviously prioritised pedestrian access. Uh, people can walk through between the trees, not cause any compassion issues, um, and uh, all supported by the pavement. Um, uh, right, so that's uh, the two, stage one and two of Tandaram Way in Broadmeadows in Melbourne, uh, in, in Victoria, Australia, where I work. And some of the learnings from, um, from the US I applied in stage two, you can see with the structural soils, the tree trenches and other things. So I think I'll obviously I've applied some of my learnings over there. Um, the other project is not a project I was involved in, but one I heard about at a, a Trina at a, at a conference. I spoke to the uh, guy that wanted it and got permission to use some of his um, uh, presentation, which I will now present to you. So Willoughby County in Sydney um, had a, an old um, tired looking two, two, two row tree morph in Sydney. It was basically a street that was blocked off. They um, probably ripped up the road, added some trees and paved it. The trees were really suffering and looking tired. Um, so they decided to redevelop. Um, one of the things they wanted to do was actually um, make the mall a more usable area. With two rows of trees, it really um, affects what can be done in the mall. So they looked at putting in a, uh, uh, basically a small row of trees down the centre. And they also decided to do some water treatment um, as part of the design. Um, so what they've done here is they've um, basically, uh, the whole mall will be perched on a on piers um, above a growing medium, which is, excuse me, entry points for water at each tree, and oxygen, and also um, drainage. So I'll show you some photos. It's really quite a successful project, and the trees are doing really well. Unfortunately, I haven't got some more recent photos of the trees. I've tried to organise some before this, but um, these photos are a couple of years old now. This is what the mall looked like. So you can see. It's just a standard shopping mall, um, and basically the trees are really suffering, um, as I mentioned earlier, and struggling to actually get uh, a good um, root development and not quite a lot of energy at all. All right, um, so we're nearly there. So this is a cross section of what it looks like. So you can see here that um, the trees are actually uh, this is the subgrade soil. They've created a base to put the tree on. But all this area around here is actually soil media. And you can see it here is suspending the slope to actually make an uncompleted root growing area. This is a cross section of the rain garden. So gravity water feeds these trees. 
um, the tree roots grow into all this zone in here, uh, and the trees really flourish. I'll get on to the next slide. So this is what it looks like under the ground. These, these are all the piers that can support the actual pavement. This is a platform for one of the trees, and the finished levels will be up around here when it's finished. Um, this is what it looks like after they've added a whole lot of soil in it. So this is the growing medium, and you can see the gap between where the, 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 these piers, the poles and piers are going to hold up the concrete and the actual soil medium to allow oxygen to get to, to go through. Um, and this is what it's like um, with all the soil being put in. This is what it looks like afterwards. So you can see this is two photos of trees. You can see where the water drains into the garden bed. Um, obviously gets into the system, has an inch so it doesn't drown. It also allows the trees to grow in an optimum growing environment. I think these trees had about 25 cubic metres, roughly, to, uh, of soil each. Um, but they're in a shared distance because they're all linked. So they're doing quite well. So these are, this is what the morphs like now, and you can see it's getting used, and, it's, and the trees are growing really well. Um, just to finish up, I want to talk a little bit about passive irrigation of land. I think that trees add a lot of the water sensitive urban design elements. Um, a little scared about putting them in there because they think you've got all the media in there, um, and, and, and then you have to pull the trees out. But they do grow so quickly that I think we should start thinking of trees as potentially disposed items that we can pull plant back in and get quick growth on. But also, I don't think that these things have to be put out as frequently as people think. Certainly at the inlets where sediment builds up, um, you, you have to. But if we look after these systems, um, a good clean catchment, um, then they shouldn't be as much of a problem. One of the things I like about trees is actively growing trees that are transpiring actual more and create a more local microclimate. Um, trees grow well in Wilson because they've pretty much got very little competition. And if you've got an adequate catchment to provide irrigation, then the trees will grow really well. Um, having larger systems um, gives us large trees to enjoy. So if we can think about in Copenhagen, they're actually looking at in, um, looking at using a whole basically road reserve underneath footpaths, roads, and all that infrastructure as a tree growing medium. I think we need to probably start thinking that way. It's um, something I want to go and have a look at if I get a chance. Um, yeah. So basically, if we have sins that are direct, the water is directed by gravity, then we have no pumps, and irrigation system, and pipes and things to look after. But we must make sure there's drainage on and drown trees. All right, um, here's some examples of some other projects we've done in Australia. These are just little curb inlets into a pit. Um, water drains into the, in the trailer. There we go, they've got drainage. This is what it looks like. There's some corny shells um, in, in Sunbury, in, in, in my castle in Victoria. Um, they're doing quite well. Here's, here's an example of how trees grow. This is the, before we upgraded the tender and waste stage two. These were some um, milias, white seeds, that were planted in Ashville. Um, they pretty much could go anywhere, and they grew really quickly. Um, these are only about um, four years old, and they, they've done a very good job. Um, in the next uh, part of the stage of the street, these trees were planted in the base with little pots, and they were eight years old, and it hardly grew. So we, as one of those project readies, and we pull this up, and now we've actually put in a tree tree on here and replanted it, and given the trees a lot more root volume, and the trees are really well. I, I see tree pits uh, as quite a negative thing. I think we should okay. tree trenches. Thank you, Jason. Really just interesting to up, topic, and um, I appreciate all the examples you provided who, today. We're going awesome. to start to think about trees and their design, especially tree needs uh, underground. Yeah, um, consider water system design techniques to the, techniques the, the projects. You're adding water, I think, I think your um, as another dimension to these projects. Frozen, but also makes them more. Do you have any questions at this um, time? Um, design for maximum canopy. Less is more. Put in less trees. We'll take a few grow bigger to and get more benefits. I know I have. Um, you need to think about permeability, drainage, and water treatment. Um, there's some facts that say that a 10% 10 10 increase in can be covered in a city, cool city, by degrees. And heat waves and climate change, I think that save lives, so that's what we're doing. Um, it's not just about having the right tree, it's about having the right space for tree to flourish. Thank you for your time, and I think that's about it. Um, if people want to contact me, um, my email address is there. JasonS at hume.vic.gov.au. I'm happy to take any questions via email, uh, but also um, if one of wants to Skype me, there's my Skype name. I'm happy to do that. And just to finish up, um, I think that's all I have time for. I think I've probably gone over time. Anyway, thank you, Hannah. Hopefully that's okay. Cheers. Thank you, Jason. I'm not sure if uh, yourself or Emmanuel has any questions.
Okay. Jason, if it's you can go ahead and, and speak if you want instead of typing. Oh, boy. Okay, cool. Sorry, I'm literally going to do this. Um, Emmanuel, your question's all right. I mean, if you do a lot of damage to roots into canopy, the canopy, trees are quite resilient and they can, and surprisingly, um, a lot of people get a bit worried about trees as long as we're not cutting into structural roots or holding the tree up. Trees naturally lose roots um, through dry areas or um, in, in nature and they grow them back areas. One of the things people forget, tree root system is three-dimensional. It goes out in waste if it's not kind. So um, if, if we do damage some roots in a particular area, um, it only temporarily sets a tree back and they can replace them pretty quick. Obviously, that's assuming the tree's growing in optimum conditions. Um, so, um, yeah, the effect, trees are very resilient. The effect, if it's a, a major removal of roots, can take years to actually manifest and show in, in the tree. So, uh, unfortunately, the damage we do to trees um, can, can take a while to show. I can't hear me, sorry. <laughs> um, that's no good. Uh, okay. Um, okay. Trees. Um, okay. Um, do you, um, we, um, um, we plant an over Sorry. Um, it seems like his line is bad right now. Oops. Survival. Anyone can you hear me now at all? I'm just wondering if Emmanuel can hear it all now. Uh, how many trees did you plant? Did you plant? Um, yeah, okay. Um, oh, um, did you see mine? Um, I asked, what is the cost of implementing structural pavement? Excuse me. Do you have an idea of what the difference is compared to not? I... And have any other questions you want to ask or type? Or... Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if any others make through. Okay. It depends on 
on the um, enough um, medium that you provide, because the structural soil is quite expensive, probably about three times the cost of normal soil. Um, can I share the presentation, please? Yeah. Uh, um, this Sorry. But, uh, uh -huh. um, I have a question. So I noticed in uh, a picture of a case study in Toronto, some of the trees are planted. I'm assuming we're going to share this on the website the presentation. What you do in Australia, or any recommendations you have, because. Here, I know that we end up talking oh, about the same trees. Now. We've recorded them on the website. Overall health <laughs> so, of the tree. Cool. I was wondering, do you prune uh, around it, or do you just plan that? Yeah, sure. When, when, yeah, when we go to the expense of putting in structural soils and rain gardens and such, we also remove power lines and underground them. Um, obviously, that adds cost as well, but then obviously you have no restriction with the canopies in. Um, in Australia, we have, um, in our older areas, we have overhead mm -hmm. power lines, but in our all our new estates and new um, shopping centre areas, we actually put them underground during development. So um, we don't have that problem in the new areas. But in the older areas, we normally have power on one of the road. So the trees on that side of the road, we normally plant a different species, a smaller species. And then in the picture of the swale, high power you, lines, you, you mentioned um, water and treatment. Bird, and I was wondering what a medium is being sized tree and, and just swale prune, as they say, prune out some of the middle of the tree. That get clearance from the power lines. Was so that the soil or was it some other mixture? But that's sort of what we do. When you say what's put into it, um, oh look, I, it was basically, it was it's a special um, ascent, so it's so basically um, um, what we use on a golf course or a uh, sports field. Um, and the idea is that the, um, the root systems, the plants, and the trees um, take up a lot of nutrients uh, that come through that medium, um, and basically um, put that into growth, um, which then can either be harvested if it's vegetation, not this trees that okay. grow into a quite a large tree. So um, the treatment is basically to take out um, uh, basically phosphorus, uh, nitrogen, and um, yeah, um, manual is going to go, that's fine. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Cool. Um, yeah, so the, um, the treatment is, is important. Um, we're trying to juice um, nitrogen to, to the receiving waters to the in Melbourne it's what's the bay, um, so that we can you know have fish growing there and, and you know no pollution I suppose. Algal blues not a problem. So that's why we do a lot of treatment. We're treating rather yeah, than treating wetlands at the end. We're actually not treating a lot of stuff at source. Um, and that's what the, the one system we've been talking about, um, more diffuse, localised treatment, um, especially in the areas of hard skin. So yeah, I don't know if that answers it. Yeah. Um, all right. Did this project minimise the water runoff in the roads? What makes the channeling of the water have on the streets? Um, it minimise the runoff, water runoff in the roads. Um, it hold. It can hold water. In the system, uh, to get pressure off the drainage system, the drains, and uh, that's good. Less runoff to the creeks. 
a landscape. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm just slow. Slow talk. This is water. All right, I don't know if that answers uh, Bishop's. I'm not sure what Bishop's name, whether it's his first name or his surname. Is there much sure. rainfall in Australia? So you know a bit dry. Um, uh, some areas do. Um, in where I am and, and working mm -hmm. out of Broad Meadows, it's quite dry. Uh, in Melbourne, we get range from about 300 millimetres up to about 0.8 metres. Um, so the 1800 millimetres. So it's quite yeah. um, that's within the city. The city's quite low. Um, and we're about 400 millimetres, so we're quite dry. Um, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> yes, definitely. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> all the pictures were great, all the different examples. So Hannah, do you think that was um, informative or useful? Cool. I could. I wasn't sure. I... Yeah, look, I, I took the most of the pictures I took myself because I, uh, um, I was the word for it. Um, yeah, so photography is a hobby more. Uh, I've had some floods in the sand. That's pretty good. <laughs> um, I think I'm good. Thank you. I just want um Hannah, you any to mention. Questions? Sorry, That's I'm right. going to switch That's slides right. really quick uh, just so everyone can yeah. see the sorry? Uh, that continuing yeah, yeah. education credit. Your units are available on our website, provalenslearning.com. Um, and there's just a brief assessment that Jason has created of five questions and then a $15 processing fee for that. And these credits go toward um, uh, certified park professional or certified park professional international certificates and can also be used for renewal of these certificates if you have one already. So thank you again. Uh, this was really great. Do you have anything else to add, Jason? No. Um, no, look, um, as I said, I'm happy to take any questions after this uh, presentation of anyone watching this um, after I've presented it. Um, my email address is in the presentation. Um, happy to share any information on, or knowledge I have. And I hope it inspires a few people, especially landscape architects and designers, to consider putting more trees in their okay. Thank you. Let's hope so. All right. All right. Great. Thanks. Thank you very much. And see you next time.